Today, we take you everywhere in the world of motorcycle racing. From the risks to the rewards, you'll see it all as the best and worst show us their stuff. Join us as we take you from the beginning to the future of motorcycling. It's all here next on the Superchargers. Everyone, I'm Jan Gabriel and welcome once again to the Superchargers. Did you know that there are close to five and a half million people who own motorcycles in this country? Well, it's true. People of all ages. And because riding a motorcycle can be dangerous, there are certain safety rules that always need to be followed, such as wearing a helmet like this one. But if motorcycles can be dangerous riding on the highway, they're even more dangerous riding on the track. Being a champion motorcycle racer is the most physically demanding job in motorsports. Riders have to be in top shape just to hang on and control their high-speed machines. Today, we're going to take you to some popular motorcycle events to see hill climbs, speedway racing, flat tracking, and teeth rattling motocross. But before we do that, let's go back, all the way back to Germany over a hundred years ago to meet Gottlieb Daimler, the man who invented the very first motorcycle. German inventor Gottlieb Daimler invented the motorcycle in 1885. His achievement was not a singular act of genius, but a combination of events that occurred in just the right order. He contributed not only to the birth of the motorcycle, but to the automobile and airplane as well. This great effort began back in 1882 with his experiments on a gasoline-powered four-cycle engine that Daimler hoped would develop into a device strong enough to power a horseless carriage. But after two years of trial and error, the half-horsepower 264cc engine he came up with just wasn't strong enough to do the job. So Daimler and his chief engineer, Wilhelm Maybach, devised a cradle frame of wood and iron to carry the engine, which protruded out beyond the frame and was surmounted by a high leather seat. It was steered by a tiller arrangement with a simple fork. It would go down in history as the very first motorcycle. Power was transmitted by a belt from one pulley wheel to another, and finally to the rear wheel. The wheels themselves were wooden spoke affairs, and the tires, if you could call them that, consisted of heavy iron bands that were shrunk to fit. It certainly was a strange looking contraption, and almost impossible to ride. On November 10, 1885, Daimler, his teenage son Paul, and Maybeck wheeled the machine out of his workshop in a suburb near Stuttgart, Germany, and fired it up. Young Paul climbed aboard, operated the lever that tightened the belt drive, and set the machine in motion. It must have been a rough ride, and very noisy. The primitive engine shook violently, and on the way back it overheated, setting the seat on fire, which was a hot start for a fast machine that has attracted a lot of controversy in the last hundred years. Despite this potentially dangerous mishap, Paul Daimler actually succeeded in riding a distance of 12 kilometers, or about seven and a half miles, making him the world's first motorcyclist. If Gottlieb Daimler could only see the advancements that have been made on his invention of a hundred years ago, he'd truly be amazed. The latest high-tech innovations in motorcycles are remarkable, and the durability is beyond belief. Just ask anyone who owns a motocross bike. They're made strong enough to run on a course that is so bumpy, it puts most automobile torture tests to shame. You can jump on them, twist them, kick them, shift gears six times in a lap. You can abuse them in any way possible, and these bikes can handle it. To prove my point, let's take a look at an AMA-sanctioned National Championship motocross event. Indoor stadiums like the Houston Astrodome offer an ideal setting for an AMA-sanctioned supercross event. The motocross motorcycle is a little unusual to say the least. There's 12 inches of travel on the front and rear tires, plus the power to weight ratio of these bikes is four times greater than you'll find in the average automobile. Tough supercross courses like this one include plenty of hairpin turns, hooky doos and rockers. They're designed to give a maximum challenge to the rider and plenty of excitement to the spectator. 
the start of a motocross race is always exciting. As 21 riders across, all try to funnel down into a narrow race plan. When the gates drop, the kids section to the first turn, banging into each other, every rider concentrating solely on his effort to lead the pack. Rounding out the first turn, the riders set up for the tricky course that lies ahead. It's a colorful feel of Hondas, Kawasaki's, Yamahas, and Suzuki's. There are factory teams and privateers. The leader of this event is a 21-year-old California factory rider named Rick Johnson. The abuse the motorcycles take is awesome. The engines develop 250 cc's of power. The bike they fly 25 to 30 feet in the air and land on heavy duty competition shock absorbers without breaking apart. The riders sit far back and confident, putting weight on the rear of the motorcycle, trying to land as often as possible on the rear wheel. What's important is not how far you jump, but how far the trajectory is. As Rick Johnson continued to lead these events, the defending champion Jeff Ward on bike number one was putting as much pressure on Johnson as possible. He continued to stay with him, hoping he could catch the leader or pressure him into making a mistake. Motocross racing is a sport where you try to relax and not push too hard in the beginning, as endurance is important. Each moto is a grueling 20-lap affair on a half-mile course. The riders are all young in their early 20s and considered to be some of the finest conditioned athletes in the world. Not only are they required to have strength, but stamina as well. Keeping the bike low and level off the jumps creates more forward momentum, and that's the key to making fast laps in motocross. In the late stages of this race, they were carrying two and three jumps at a time, and this means less work for the rider and the machine. But sometimes the rider will fall short, or as in this case, try to stretch it out too far. The result is disastrous. Here, Rick Johnson, after crashing down on top of one of the rockers, gives up his lead to Jeff Ward. Moving into second place is rider number six, another motocross superstar, David Bailey. One small miscalculation has taken Johnson from first to third place. The more obstacles you can clear in the air, the less you have to deal with on the ground. If you watch closely, each rider attempts to push the motorcycle over the jump. This is accomplished by moving your arms forward and the rest of your body back. It gives the bike a little more thrust over the hill. Jeff Roy, the leader of this event, at age 44, is at the top of his sport. Like so many others, he's in California, where they ride motorcycles the year round. And if there's a classic championship profile, Jeff fits it perfectly. Young, aggressive, smart, and extremely efficient rider. Winning this event is just one more super accomplishment. David Bailey finished second on this day, and Rick Johnson settled for third. In the grueling sport of motocross, anything can happen. I remember the first motorcycle race that I ever saw. It was run on a flat track with no fancy jumps or whoop de doos Just hard riding, flat out racing. It's a special kind of endurance test for riders. It's a continuous course round and round with uh, 12, 15 competitors snapping at your heels all the time at better than 100 miles an hour. Flat tracking can be short or long, depending on the size of the track. Could be a quarter mile, a half mile, or a full mile. Right now, let's take a look at some wheel banging, leather swapping, flat tracking. Flat tracking is what they call it. Highly competitive motorcycle racing. Hi everyone, I'm Del Clark. This is Hawthorne Park, a horse racing track just outside of Chicago. But on this day, it was groomed for 17 motorcycles. Thunderous motorcycles. It was an AMA national championship event, mounted on their 750cc machines with the best in the world. The early leader was number 67, Bubba Shoulder, a tough young Texan. Tucked in right behind him as they ran over 100 miles an hour down the back straightaway was number three, Ricky Graham out of Seaside, California. Setting up for the third turn, Graham charged to the inside and took the lead away from Schobert, nose to tail. These exciting motorcycles pulled it down the front straightaway, building speed back up again to over 100 miles an hour. These riders compete in 23 events a year, chasing the illustrious national championship. They race not only in flat track events, but tourist trophy and road races as well. As this event continued, Bubba Schobert muscled his way back into the lead. This is a sport where side-by-side -side racing is common and dangerous. And there is danger everywhere. Wheel bump, oversteering, sliding up, anything and everything can happen. It's not a sport for timid young men, but courage is only part of it. A savvy rider must think quickly as the other riders bob and weave in front of him, and pressure mounts from the riders in back. As you watch these riders, you can see there's little room for error at the speeds they're running. For a motorcycle racer, the chance of injury is much greater than in any other type of motorsport. His helmet and leather suit are about all he has. Oftentimes, he's at the mercy of the 
Now, as we watch the final lap of this race, Bubba Schobert is being overtaken on the outside by Randy Goss. Ricky Graham goes to the inside and takes the lead through the corner. Here's where you can really appreciate the skill and the thrill of the sport. Keep your eye on the third place fight. Bubba Schobert, using a drafting technique, he'll slingshot his way up alongside the leader. Goss in the second place machine will do the same. Both will blow by Graham, leaving him back in third. Now, the game starts all over again. Graham gets past Goss and will have to attempt the same slingshot technique to get past Bubba Schobert as they come down for the checkered flag. He draws alongside the leader, and at the finish, Ricky Graham on the number three bike will win it by just inches. And that is what Black Bracket is all about. A program on motorcycles wouldn't be complete without a look at road racing. It's graceful and fast. These riders turn and lean their way around the course. Lean the wrong way and it can take you out of action in a hurry. Most spills are harder on the equipment than the rider, but it's still a tough way to go out of the race. But if you hurry, you might be able to catch up. Most riders are seasoned professionals who have the finest in racing equipment and understand the dangers inherent in the sport. They're careful to follow a smooth and safe line around the course. Wearing knee pads, the rider must round out the turn just as close to the asphalt as possible. The skill in this sport includes the ability to not only make left and right hand turns, but to hang on to a vibrating motorcycle at speeds up to 130 miles an hour. It's an awesome task when you only have two wheels under you. A fall can spell disaster for a rider as he tumbles from his high-speed machine rolling and twisting, fighting to keep his body tucked in. In most instances, the rider will get up, dust himself off, and try again. It's the stuff champions are made of. Road racing at its grandest level takes place in Europe, where factory motorcycle teams compete for the world championship. Here in the United States, there is professional road racing where the competition is always superb. I'm Del Clark. When we return on the Superchargers, you'll see the famous Widowmaker Hill Climb, and we'll take a look at those good-looking guys on the hot Speedway bikes. Don't go away! Hi everyone, we're back on the Superchargers and I'm Jan Gabriel. Today we're exploring some of the hottest kinds of motorcycle racing here in America. We're going to take you to the famous Woodamaker Hill Climb and take a look at an experimental vehicle that may change the future of the motorcycle. But first, let's go to California, the hotbed of Speedway bikes, where riders from around the world come to compete. <laughs> Speedway bike racers have to be card sharks of sorts. They draw for starting positions. Here, the colorful riders have come from all over the world to the South Bay Stadium, an eight-mile track in Gardena, California. Speedway bike racing in the United States is a California phenomenon, although its roots are European. This event you're about to see promises to be one of the best of the night. With a handicapped start, eight riders will run eight laps. Now, unlike anything you've ever seen before, you race Speedway bikes sideways. That's right, sideways. Watch these riders now as they literally turn right to go left, throwing their motorcycles into a side slide motion that carries them around much of the racetrack. Maneuvering your machine around the other bikes is truly a difficult task. Almost like an acrobat, it takes skill and balance combined with the right touch of the throttle. One slight miscalculation can cause a chain reaction crash. Here, two riders make errors and three riders go down. Involved are Walt Farnham, Greg Hancock, and 24-year-old Bobby Ott. As you can see, it is Bobby Ott who is somewhat shaken. This is a pure spectator sport. It offers something for everyone. The fans are dedicated and loyal. The replay shows us that Walt Farnham, running third, gets a little out of shape and tumbles from his machine. Directly in front of him, Greg Hancock overslides a little bit. Then the motorcycle lifts up on him and flips over backwards. Bobby Ott had no place to go and crashed into Hancock's motorcycle. All the riders were back for the restart. In this world-class race, every one of them had a chance at winning. The previous laps had been counted. Everyone was pumped for some flat-out racing. Into the first turn, it was Jay Giannetti with Billy Hamill in the number two spot. Bobby Ott, who had just been through that headbanger accident, was coming up through the middle and to the outside. On the inside, Billy Hamill had taken the lead. The Britisher Kelly Moran was working the inside up to the number two spot and in hot pursuit of Hamill. Bobby Ott running third went down for a second time, but the war continued between Hamill on the inside and Moran chasing him down on the outside, the two of them broad sliding through the turns. The fans were loving every minute of it. It was a classic showdown main event. 
A young 16-year-old American in the lead with a seasoned British champion in pursuit. Hamill kept on the low side of the racetrack as Moran tried to catch him up from the high side. Down the straightaways, it was side by side. And then, disaster. Moran coming off the corner hard, runs into Billy Hamill. Both riders and machines crashing to the ground. The crowd was stunned to see these great racers down in the midst of such a sensational race. The replay shows Hamill drifted up to the high side of the racetrack. Moran caught him with his front wheel. Kelly went crashing into the guardrail. Hamill tumbling to the ground. Moran with a few bruises was helped off the field and finished for the night. Hamill joined the field for the restart. Brad Oxley from San Clemente, California and Jay Giannetti were leading the race when the red flag came out. So on the second restart, they were up front. With a good start, the field catapulted into the first turn. It was Brad Oxley leading the six other machines. Giannetti was second with Walt Barnum in the number three spot and Sean Moran rounding out the fast four. Barnum in the yellow helmet started to make his move. He was putting pressure on Giannetti, the two of them swapping leather as they headed into the turn. It was a great duel for the number two spot. Neither rider gave an inch. They pressed on, trying to outdistance each other. Oxley, the leader, drew further and further away. It would be tough to catch him with only one lap remaining. Then a surprise. On the final lap, the Britisher, Sean Moran, went full throttle on the outside to get around both Barnum and Giannetti. The Britisher must have been waiting in the wings, but he would finish second to the 27-year-old American superstar, Brad Oxley, in a speedway bike race that would long be remembered. Now picture in your mind a 1,200 foot hill with a 72 degree incline and six foot vertical ledges dug out from the mountain to prevent anyone from making it to the top. That's what you'll find in Draper, Utah, the location for the world famous outlaw hill climb, the Widowmaker. It's been around for 25 years now, but it took 13 years of trying before anyone succeeded in climbing to the top. Now, if you're looking for a motorcycle event that the whole family can compete in, this is it. Five classes accommodate everybody from the kids to grandpa. There it is. They call it a hill, but it's really a mountain. And they climb it with motorcycles. It's the Widowmaker, famous for its challenge and unique for its location here in Utah. The object is to get your motorcycle from the bottom to the top. Now, in the old days, they used regular motorcycles and everybody went butt over tea kettles. In this day and age, the bikes are high-tech. They've got stretch frames and the weirdest assortment of rear wheels you've ever seen. Steel cups that are supposed to dig in and grab all the way to the top of the hill. Now, when it comes to climbing the hill itself, there aren't too many riders who make it to the top. Some years, nobody makes it. And even after you try and fail, hang on to that machine. Picking your way through the wild grass and buttercups and over-accelerating from dirt clod to dirt clod can almost be traumatic, but not nearly as much as having your motorcycle chase you back down the hill. These riders work long, hard hours, night after night, stretching the frames on these motorcycles to make sure that the bike never goes over backwards. Over 300 motorcycles will attempt the hill. They keep coming at it all day long, bike after bike. They'll get more than one try, but it's never enough. For most, the thrill of getting even near the top of Widowmaker is worth the effort. They come from all over the United States to try and try. Now here's a man with a plan. He figures he can get the bike a little further forward if he goes backwards. As long as you keep the bike moving forward, you're still in the competition. Even if your feet touch the ground, you're still okay, but not your whole body. Now here's a top contender. He's got what it takes. A slick motorcycle, a classy style, fortitude, and everybody's rooting for him. Keep it straight. Put on the power. That's it. You can do it. You can be the one over the top. Oh, let's be the guy that did it. Well, I'm going to take it easy until I get right below the cliff and just start going for it there. And it paid off. It worked. Rougher than hell, though. Modern high-performance motorcycles are complicated, highly specialized pieces of machinery that are flexible enough to adapt to our changing terrain and provide us with the durability and speed that we need. But what would it be like to ride on a motorcycle of the future? We recently discovered an unusual experimental vehicle that if it catches on, everybody may soon be riding one.
As the cost of automobiles and gasoline goes up, motorcycles are becoming a popular alternative form of transportation for everybody. And new and different types of motorcycling events, such as hill climbs and motocross, are really attracting more and more people all the time. But the challenge of the Iron Ponies still remains strongest for the hot young jockeys who dream of riding high-speed bikes to victory on fast tracks, offering enough danger and excitement to last a lifetime. I'm Jane Gabriel. Hope you'll join us next time right here on The Superchargers.